you were created in the image of God. A purposeful and pristine reflection of a God of love. When God saw the way you were created, He smiled and said, That's so good. Yet, our lives are quite the drama. Stories of both vice and victory. Sin makes its mark on us, our wounds, our shame, and our insecurity. But what if we could reclaim our core identity? And what if we could reimagine why we exist? What if we just say yes to becoming human again? Hey, have you ever had your really well thought out, well laid out plans just come crumbling and falling apart? Anybody ever been there? <laughs> Some of you are lying. Um, I know you've all been there. Uh, Carolee and I had dated for two years. We met in college, my freshman year of college, and we both, after a couple of years, knew we had found the one. So it was time to like get moving. And so I saved a bunch of money so that I could buy a ring, and uh, I, I put a bunch of money that I had earned from uh, working at the school I was going to, and I bought this ring, and I had this plan to propose during Christmas break because uh, my family lived in Wichita, her family lived in Maine at the time, and so uh, Christmas break was a good time where we would be together, and I had a plan to propose. What's, what's better than proposing during Christmas season, right? So the, the story that's, that's important, so you don't think I'm just kind of a weird guy, but um, we had met, the first time we ever met was at a bowling alley in Wichita, Kansas. It was just a casual greeting of mutual friends. She had some friends that uh, I knew, and, and so they invited me to go bowling. I didn't know she'd be there, and I showed up, and there she was, and that's where we met, and a friendship kind of um, developed from there. And so my plan for the proposal was to go back to the bowling alley and the place where we met. But this is what I did. I bought a bowling ball for her and had it drilled custom to her. And then I wrote a poem because that was kind of our thing when we were dating. And I took some masking tape over the bowling ball and, and I wrote her a poem. And I bought her a bowling bag and some shoes. And I was going to give her this bowling bag with the ball and the shoes and she would read the poem and I would ask her to marry her at the place where we first met, which is pretty cool, right? Okay, not that cool, whatever. <laughs> uh, so I made plans at the bowling alley, had a time picked out, had a day picked out, and of course told all a bunch of our family and friends we were gonna be ready, we were gonna go do it on this night. I don't remember exactly which night it was, but a few hours before that night, my sister-in-law, who lived in Wichita, went into labor, early labor, with one of their kids. And uh, if you know anything about Carolee, she's a labor and delivery nurse. That's what she's done for 15 years. She would much rather be in a delivery room than at a bowling alley. <laughs> so we had all these plans set up, and we were going to go. We get the call that she's in labor, and Carolee says, see you guys, I'm going to the hospital. And we were all like, okay, I guess this is out the window. And so because the baby was premature, if I remember right, it took a couple days. And so not only was the, the marriage proposal postponed a day, but it was postponed a couple days. And finally, when it came time for us to be able to, to go to the bowling alley and uh, for me to do this, it was now on a weekend night and the bowling alley was much busier and there was a bigger crowd, and you couldn't make a reservation. It was one of those things where you just had to show up and stand in line. So we finally get all the crew back together. We go to the bowling alley, and there's just no way we're going to get a lane. They are packed full. I talk to the manager like, hey, I was actually going to propose. Can you get us on a lane? No. Can't get you on a lane. Nothing. So I turned to my parents who were there, and I said, I've been trying and trying for the whole week to make this happen. I said, we met in the parking lot. Let's just go do it in the parking lot. <laughs> so here we are in the parking lot. 
leaning up against my parents' car. You can see I, the bowling shoes there. There's the bowling ball with, with the masking tape and the shoes, and I asked her to marry me. Isn't that pretty special? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I know you're jealous. Not everybody has a fairy tale <laughs> proposal, but we definitely did. Um, but uh, to be honest, I never planned to propose to her in the parking lot of a bowling alley. But sometimes things just don't go as planned, right? Just don't go as planned. In the series we've been in, we've come to appreciate that the plan of all creation The original plan was that humans would be created in the very image of God and that we would have um, the, the ability to point to and reflect to a holy God embedded with this goodness of God that we were created. Everything was good. There was a plan. We had all that we needed. The components were in place. But we talked about last week, that plan went sideways, didn't it? We talked about how sin is the shadow of our untrusting, self-reliant selves that we cast on the world. A shadow that wreaks havoc on creation. And it makes us miserably self-conscious and self-consumed. And in that self-deception and shame, we actually go and we hide from a God who is relentlessly pursuing us. And in full acceptance of our sin... In the acknowledgement that we failed and that plans have gone awry, our only hope is to be saved from sin, to be saved from its effect. And so I guess what I'm saying is we need a savior, right? And so today we read a story of salvation, but it might not be the story you think we're going to read about salvation because we're staying firmly planted in the book of Genesis. If you have your Bible or your phone, would you pull it out? Right now, I'd love for you to follow along with whatever you brought with you. And we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 5. And it's the story of a man named Noah. And if you went to Sunday school as a kid, you know Noah because he built a ark. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, a story of a Savior. Beginning in verse 5, we see the bad news. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So the human race comes out of the garden. This garden that they were created in and given in all the fullness and goodness of God. And things unravel quickly after that tree. After Adam and Eve take the apple and sin, things go downhill fast. And you can hear the severity of the situation in the extreme language here in this verse. We aren't talking a few bad people. We aren't talking some broken systems. We aren't even talking about a mostly evil reality with some bright spots mixed in with it. We're talking about every heart was only evil all the time. And look at God's response to the state of affairs in verse 6. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. He regretted he made us? Don't you wish that weren't in the Bible? His heart was deeply troubled. This has got to be a misprint, right? Somebody misinterpreted what God must have been feeling. This shouldn't be there. But maybe not, because don't we all know what it's like to have a plan, a beautiful, glorious plan, and for that plan to fall apart right in front of you? We know the disappointment, wondering why we even tried so hard in the first place. Yet, what we don't know, what we truly can't understand is this depth of grief and regret. The words translated here, deeply troubled, here they can mean an unfulfilled longing that God had. And here's the thing. He vulnerably gave his heart to us. He trusted us. He chose to really be intertwined, our whole being with his whole being. 
All of God's joy was bound up in us, his treasure. And we drug him through hell. Most therapists, if you talk to them, will admit that there's no pain quite like the pain of abandonment of an unfaithful or abandoning spouse. You know, the, the love story, you fall for someone, you're, you're in love, you, in, you choose to spend your life with them, to invest everything you have with them. You sacrifice so that two can become one, only to see betrayal, only to have them leave. This is what the author of Genesis is talking about when they describe God's heart in this unfulfilled longing. It's similar to the pain expressed in that kind of betrayal. This is the state of brokenness that had come over us. Jeremiah actually ex expresses God's emotion for us in his uh, book, chapter 3. God says, how gladly would I treat you like my children and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. And here's the thing. Most of the time when we think of Noah's Ark, we think about what we learned about as a kid we think about how cool it is that Noah listened to God. He was obedient and he built the ark. We think about how God was so thoughtful to not only save a family, but to save the animals. And two by two, they come onto the boat. We celebrate this in kids' church. Yet as we get older, all of us in the back of our mind are thinking, did God just kill every person and animal not on that boat? That's a big response. Yet, maybe the story of the flood and the story of Noah and his ark are meant to tell us more about what's happening in God's heart than it is meant to tell us about what was happening in the world. Because humanity was screaming with vitriol, we don't want you, God. We don't trust you, God. We don't need you, God. And every evil rebellion of a human heart was actually undoing the goodness of God's creation. God's heart was mashed like the spouse of an adulterous floozy. And God sits in this pain with unfulfilled longing. He suffers, he weeps, and he stays vulnerable. His heart endures the unintended consequences of a relationship built on love. And what's really cool is that God responds to his creation in truth and in love. You see, if you want to mitigate how much pain you uh, ever go through in this life, then what you can do is you can either choose to be a person of truth or a person of love, but not both. If you're a person of truth, then it's your, it's your, uh, your mandate. It, it's who you're calling just to say it like it is and to tell the truth. If somebody's wrong, you let them know. If, if there's uh, somebody out of line who does something different than you, then you speak truth to them, no matter what it costs you. If there's any correction or judgment to be made, it's your responsibility to make it. And, and honestly, if you live this way, you'll avoid lots of relational pain. You know why? Because people won't want to be around you. <laughs> You'll have a circle of friends that is probably interested in doing the same thing you're interested in doing, and you'll create some sort of echo chamber that isolates almost everybody in your life. But you can also avoid a lot of pain by being on the other end, just being a person of love. I'm going to love everyone no matter what. I'm going to keep the peace and tolerate. And no matter the cost, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to speak up. I'm not going to call wrong, wrong. I'm just going to love everyone. Let's just gather in and, and hug each other and, and talk about how good we are and, and encourage one another. If you live your life this way, you'll have lots of friends and you'll avoid pain because you'll never have the courage to step in in a healthy way 
to truly lead somebody to goodness of everlasting life. But the heart of God in the story of Noah gives us a glimpse of what it looks like to love and vulnerability, embracing both truth and love. You see, God is so serious about his purposes for creation. He didn't mess it up. There wasn't a mistake. It doesn't need redone. He was serious about his purposes in creation. And he has the highest expectations of us, his creation. He cares about how we live and the purposes we chase. And so in verse 7, he is unwilling to abandon his design. He is not giving up. He is so firmly against the evil that he is, uh, that he's so firmly against the evil that's destroying us, I should say, that he will act in uncompromising power to destroy what's destroying us. And you can see that in the extreme here in this story. Yet God's heart is so flooded with love for his people And he is so unwilling to lose relationship that in the next verse, verse 8, in his loving grace, it says he finds favor with Noah. He finds one who has a, a capacity for his love and his grace. And the reason God's heart is so troubled is because He reigns with both truth and love. And when you do that, you stand in a vulnerable position. You see, what we see in the story of the flood is a God-shaped heart that is simultaneously willing to stay committed to truth and willing to stay committed to love. And this is an example that we are meant to grasp and embody So God finds favor with Noah. He builds a boat, gathers some animals, gathers his family. They get on the boat. The rain comes down, right? 40 days, 40 nights, and all of creation drowns below the shelter of Noah's ark. Then the rain begins to draw back and land reappears and Noah and his family and the animals emerge. They're saved, right? And often our focus in Noah's salvation is this idea that he was saved from evil or that he was saved from God's judgment or that he is saved from the rising waters of destruction. And while all of that is beautifully true, it's also incomplete. And Tim Crutcher, who wrote the book, Becoming Human Again, reminds us that any view of salvation that only affirms what creation is freed from without exploring what creation is freed for, omits half the biblical story of salvation. So as Noah comes off the boat and we read the story, we must recognize that Noah is saved from judgment and death, but he's also saved to live into a brand new creation that is unwrapped right in front of him. In fact, as he comes off the boat, God gives Noah the same command he gives Adam when he creates him. You see it in Genesis 1. You see it in Genesis 9. Be fruitful and multiply. Because Noah is not just rescued from a bad place of sin and pulled away just so that he doesn't have to endure evil. Noah is given this fresh start. He's given this new identity And he's given an opportunity again to live into his original design. When most salvation efforts are focused on just extracting us from some place we don't want to be, a terrible scene. God's salvation efforts are focused on planting us in a new creation. Giving us another opportunity to become human again. I wonder sometimes if as Christians... We think of God's salvation just a little bit too narrowly. And I think we have reasons for doing so. But when we imagine what happened to us in our salvation, if you say to somebody, I know that Jesus saved me by faith, you think about your salvation in Jesus. We often think of forgiveness, right? We are forgiven from our sins. We think of an opportunity to live with God forever after we die. We think of 
this grace that removes our guilt and shame. It, it lifts the burden off of our shoulders. And all of that is, is true. All of that is definitely worthy of celebration. But God's salvation also includes a brand new start. A fresh start in a new creation to live the way we were originally designed to live. See, your salvation is a restoration. You are made new and given new opportunities. And when with this new opportunity comes this renewed commitment from God, which we can't miss. Noah comes off the boat. He has this fresh start, new creation right in front of him. And God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. So this new opportunity right in front of Noah comes with it a new covenant. And God is committing to be with us. No longer will creation suffer judgment in the way of the flood where, where God destroys his creation. But now God covenants to be with us in new creation. Isaiah 41 and 43 flesh this out so beautifully. This is a passage that I think about and read often where God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to his people, fear not for I am what? With you. Be not, dis be, be not dismayed for I am your God. Fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, they shall not overwhelm you. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann declares that now God resolves that he will stay with. He will endure and sustain his world. He will not let the rebellion of humankind sway him from his grand dream for creation. This is good news. God with us. Because here's the thing we, we must remember. Sin is still present when Noah comes off the boat. Sin got on the boat inside of Noah. And it reared its head just moments after the boat landed. If you're familiar with the story of Noah as he walks off the boat, we hear the story of how Noah passes out drunk and his sons are taking care of him. And he's naked. And it's embarrassing. There's conflict and turmoil. This is, this is right after Noah walks off the boat. Literally, Noah finds favor with God. Noah is saved from evil and destruction. Noah is, is literally in the boat watching the water of God's judgment rise. And he sees the penalty of sin. He grasps it in his head. He understands the cost of rebelling against God. And Noah walks off the boat. And he falls into this weird, sin, this weird scene of sin and self-focus. What in the world? Here's the thing. You can't scare people out of hell. If you could scare anyone out of sin, Noah would have been the one you could have scared out of sin, right? He watched waters drown the earth. If you could scare somebody into a perfect life, if you could threaten them into sinlessness, Noah would have been our example. But you can't scare people out of hell. You can't threaten people into holiness. You need and I need to be restored and reformed, to be recreated afresh. Because we still need a Savior. We still need grace. And the good news is, that Savior was coming, our new Adam, our new Noah, and God's own son as a human, just like us, to remind us of our true nature and to empower us to live as God intended us to live. Paul says it 
so well in Ephesians 2. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. But because of his great love for us, God did not abandon us because he's rich in mercy. He made us alive with Christ, a new creation. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And this salvation is much more than just forgiveness. It's much more than just rescue. It's more than heaven when we die. This salvation means that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And you have taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on a new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. John tells us that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and if we will remain in him, and he in us, then we will bear much fruit. But apart from him, we can do nothing. Paul again in Romans, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. This is the truth of who we are. As salvation creates anew in us. This is the truth of what happens when a God is willing to endure in vulnerability to proclaim both truth and love. This is the new world we walk into as we step off the own, our own boat, our own ark. We step out of our sin into the power that Christ brings to us. You see, this is the gospel good news that Jesus not only saves you, but he recreates you so that you can live into your design. So church, may we live in the fullness of our salvation. Not just the part that keeps us out of hell, but the fullness of salvation, which empowers us to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. May we plant our feet firmly in the new creation, believing by grace that it's provided by God and God alone. And if we do, then we discover what it means to become human again. To become human again. Let's pray. Lord, would you change us? Would you remake us? Would you reform us? Lord, would, would you come in the power of resurrection, the same exact power that raised Jesus from the dead? Would you so fill us with that power that we are enabled to live exactly how you created us to, to live? God, would you help us, would you help me to cast off the old self the self so focused internally to cast off the rebellion, the self-consciousness, the, the self-determination, Lord, to, to put it away and to put on the new self which your spirit provides. And Lord, would you unite us as a church in this new creation that we might actually be able to reach up into heaven and grab the kingdom of God the way the world was intended to be and we may be able to bring it down, to pull it down in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, in the streets we live, in the places we work, in the schools we attend. Could it be, God, that we embrace salvation in a new way that recreates in us our original design to be holy followers of Jesus. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.